So we're starting with uh, May 21 RTP. Let's uh, get started with the, the questions. If there is any amendments or there is any changes in the concept that you have to learn, I'll specifically note that so that uh, accordingly the answers can also be changed. Okay. So I'll read the question for you first. So like we started yesterday, we are looking at uh, the MCQ question, which is a case study based MCQ. So we will read that particular MCQ first and uh, then we will look at the uh, four or five questions that comes after the case study. So as, uh, as I discussed earlier also, this is uh, May 21 RTP which means that those amendments that was applicable for uh, your May 21 examination that would be the one which they will have as uh, you know that will be the one that will be focused in this particular RTP but then few RTPs if you look at uh, I think some lazy fellows prepared RTP for GST they did not add any additional questions okay they they put some question from the book itself and maybe one question extra they prepared but some RTPs like this RTP you know the May 22 RTP yesterday we discussed all new questions in November 21 RTP also there were a lot of new questions so we could actually get familiar with New questions and that will add as an asset for us for the examination okay so all case studies uh, are good so for you to get full complete clarity case studies are good there is an mcq case study booklet announced by icai you can download it from uh, the knowledge portal and then you can refer through that it's a it's a very good one and uh, if you guys wanted a quick recap of the provision i have already uploaded a few videos on the uh, uh, on the YouTube channel, you can always watch that. But then uh, understand, I think I uploaded that an attempt back. So there is an amendment video also that you have to additionally uh, look at. That's also important. Okay, now let's uh, go ahead and then read this. Mrs. Aditi and Company, a partnership firm registered under GST, is uh, undertaking various government projects. The firm has uh, let out on hire the following vehicle. A motor vehicle to carry more than 15 passengers to state government electricity department. Second, an electric motor vehicle to carry more than 12 passengers to local municipal corporation. An electric motor vehicle to carry up to 12 passengers to state transport undertaking okay so they're talking about giving motor vehicle to different different people like state uh, government electricity department an electric motor vehicle to carry more than 12 passengers to local municipal corporation electric vehicle to carry uh, up to 12 passengers up to 12 passengers okay, to state transport undertaking so all of these are like you know slightly different in each other's understanding Then, okay, I'll discuss corresponding provisions also. Okay, so it is relevant for you to understand that this is to a state electricity department. It is relevant for you to understand that this uh, satisfy all the conditions. You have to understand this is only up to twelve passenger. A firm provided the following additional information for the month of October. First one. A works contract service were availed for construction of immobile property being planned and missionary. Value of GST component is 1,10,000. Uh, GST amounting to 70,000 was paid on account of demand of the department due to fraud in, uh, in, in returns filed. Okay, so there is a demand and there was a fraud that has happened which means that there is a notice that would have come in section 74 and based on that they have paid some gs these are all block to credit concept they had they are trying to discuss then goods valuing rupees 10 lakh gst on the same as 1 lakh were received 180 days ago invoice were also issued on the date of receipt of supply for which payment has been made till the date to the extent of 4 lakh towards a value of 40,000 towards taxes. 
so they had an invoice received like 180 days uh, before and they have not made full payment yet okay they only made partial payments the firm made two independent outward supplies in which value of supply was understated in one case by 75000 overstated 45000 in another case looks like you know common uh, repetition even in another mcq uh, case study that we discussed yesterday we had similar cases applicable then the firm received certain supply of goods from registered persons on which tax was payable under reverse charge basis okay. so they received some supply from a registered person for which tax was payable under rca all amounts given above are exclusive of taxes wherever applicable all transactions referred to are intrastate all conditions for ITC have been fulfilled subject to the information given below. Now let's look at the questions that we have. From the information given above, choose the most appropriate answer for question 1 to 5 given below. Number 1. In respect of vehicle let out, by, let out on hire by the firm, service that are exempt from GST are. So what are the exemptions that is available? Out of the uh, out of the vehicle that was given on rent, let us see what are the uh, what are the exemption that is applicable. First one, letting on hire a motor vehicle to state electricity department more than fifteen passengers, is that available as exemption? Second one, letting on hire an electro electric vehicle to local municipality more than twelve passengers, letting on hire an electric vehicle to state transport undertaking less than twelve passengers. So, uh, since you know some of you would not have revised the exemption already, I'm going to go back to the area where it is discussed, and then I'll come back and then you know ask you the same question. You will be able to answer. Providing vehicle on hire, there are four exemptions available. Please remember, there are four exemptions when you are giving a vehicle on hire. On what? Hire charges. A third person is giving on hire. But this is a conditional exemption that you have. What do you mean by conditional exemption? This exemption is applicable only for a specific type of vehicle and only when you give it to a specified person. So it's a conditional exemption. Not every hire of vehicle is exempted. Now let's see what are the four conditional exemptions that we have. First exemption, you are giving a motor vehicle for more than 12 passengers. First exemption is you are giving a motor vehicle for more than 12 passengers which means that you are giving, a, giving uh, something like a mini bus or a bus to whom you are giving to a state transport undertaking for example KSRTC. You are giving a motor vehicle for more than 12 passengers again on something like a bus more than 12 passengers to a state uh, transport undertaking like ksrtc that will be exempted first exemption second one what is the second exemption say you are having a school bus and you are giving the school bus to a school for transportation of student staff faculty is it exempted or taxable that is exempted this that exemption is discussed in Educational services exemption, a third party, say somebody like me, I have a bus available with me. So I am I am I'm going to a school and saying that I'll do the pickup and drop for you. Okay, so I'm actually taking up the service of transportation of students, staff, faculty that is exempted. Now the second exemption which is connected to this and available is that if you are having a bus and you give this bus on hire, the first one is not giving bus on hire, the first one is giving transportation services here i am giving transportation services of student staff faculty to school that is exempted but then a different exemption entry now i am having a bus i am giving this bus on hire to a person who is providing transportation of student staff faculty to a preschool till high secondary that is also exempted so there are two exemptions that is available transportation of student staff faculty is exempted and a giving a school bus on hire to a person who is actually giving. So, a Mr. Gopal who was actually giving transportation of student staff faculty to school has outsourced.
that work to somebody and then taking a bus say, for example Gobal's buses are like you know punctured or require repair so he has taken some buses from Mr. Sundar who's having a lot of buses available so that particular hire done by Sundar to Mr. Gopal is also exempted. How many exemptions in total I told you? There are four exemptions that is available for transaction of giving motor vehicle for hire. The next exemption that is available, when you are giving a goods transport vehicle, a truck or a goods van, you are giving it to whom? A GTA, a goods transportation agency. That is also exempt. Now, the last exemption, which was like an amendment to, uh, you know, a year back. That's why this was tested in that, you know, RTP. That was talking about an electric vehicle. But that electric vehicle has to be for more than 12 passengers. And it has to be given on hire to a local authority. For example, Kochi Nagara Sabha. That's a local authority. So, if there is an electric vehicle for more than 12 passengers, is given on hire to Kochi Nagara Sabha. Like that is a local authority, then that will also be exempted. There's a question from here. Is the school transportation to all is exempted? Uh, I did not get your question. So still I'll try to make understanding. A transportation done by school to students, staff, faculty is anyway exempted. Transportation, if it is undertaken by the school, it is anyway exempted because any service is provided to SSF. Student staff faculty is exempted if it is undertaken by the school. Second exemption is if there is a third party which is giving the services to school. Say Don Bosco school has like say 1000 students. Now I am having a lot of buses and I approach Don Bosco school and I am telling that I will do transportation of your student staff faculty. Then whatever I collect from Don Bosco school that is also exempted. So here the supplier is a third party. The supplier is a third party and the recipient is school and that school has to be preschool till high secondary it can be private school public school but tuition center will not come under that only school i'll explain the gta say agarwal gta agarwal gta is a very famous gta okay, so they do goods transportation now i'm having a truck i give this truck on hire i am giving this truck for a month to use to gta and I'm charging 50,000 per month for the truck. Is my truck, you know, truck hiring charges of 50,000 taxable or exempt? That is exempt. Because I'm giving this goods transportation vehicle to a GTA. That is also exempt. So there are four types of exemption. And all are conditional exemption. You look at it. An electric vehicle for more than 12 passengers, which means again an electric bus. This has happened. If you uh, really look at the news, there was... Uh, some electric buses that the government has taken on lease okay and say kochi corporation has taken uh, you know an electric bus on lease and then running across uh, you know in in kochi for transportation they are running as a you know public buses in kochi now if i am the one who is the owner of these electric buses i am charging from kochi corporation every month 1 lakh rupees will it be taxable or exempt it will be exempt are you guys understanding all four exemptions is it clear any doubt All right. Okay. Now let's go back to the question. Now, when you go back to the question, you will have much better clarity. So they're asking out of these in the in the paragraph that we had, there were three type of vehicle that fellow has given on hire. In which of these vehicle will qualify to get exemption is the question. First one, letting on letting on hire a motor vehicle to state electricity department. Will it have exemption to electricity department? Which department when I give it on hire that will get exemption? State transport undertaking. KCB will not get exemption. If I am giving it to KCB, I will not get exemption. But if I give it to KSRTC, I would have got exemption. Are you understanding? So, this will not have any exemption. So, this is taxable. Second one. I am giving an electric vehicle. To a local municipality, that electric vehicle is for more than 12 passengers. Does it qualify to get exemption? Does it satisfy all the conditions that is listed? Yes, this will also get exemption. This is exempt. Next, letting on hire an electric vehicle 
to stay transport undertaking. So, it would satisfy all the conditions. Okay, I am giving a motor vehicle to stay transport undertaking, but less than 12 passengers. Will I get exemption? No, it should be more than 12 passengers. So, I am giving like a car to KSRTC. Will I get exemption? No, this is also taxable. So, which is the only one that get exemption? So, which option would you treat it as correct? Option B is correct. All right. Then, next question. Determine the amount of eligible ITC to be claimed by the firm for the month of October. So, there were a lot of purchases that they have made. We will have to understand how much will be the eligible ITC that they are going to get. So, there is 70,000, 1 lakh, 10,000, 1 lakh, 80,000, nil. Let's go back to that area where they are talking about ITC. Okay. First one, works contract service were availed for construction of immobile property being planned and missionary where the value of GST component is 1,10,000. Can I take this as ITC? Okay, so section 17.5c says that in invert supply of works contract service for construction of immobile property other than planned and missionary is blocked. So here I am actually constructing an immobile property but it's a missionary that is attached to the earth. If I incur some expenses to construct a plant and missionary, should I get ITC on that? Yes, I will get ITC. So, 1,10,000, I can take ITC. Then, GST amounting to 70,000 was paid on account of demand of department due to fraud. After finding out fraud, this fellow had paid 70,000 of GST. Okay. Now, can I, can I take the credit of that? I cannot take credit. Second, section 17.5i, correct. Section 17.5i, if you had uh, looked at our charts, it's the last point in the chart. After 17.5h, which talks about, uh, you know, giving free sample gift and etc. The last one is that, where tax is paid after finding out tax evasion under section 74, 129, 130, all that is given. So, this is one of such cases. I cannot take any ITC in such cases. It is blocked. Okay. Then. Third one. Uh, goods valuing uh, 10 lakh that was taken as ITC long, long back. So, how much will be the eligible ITC here? Out of 1 lakh 10,000, 70,000, only 1 lakh 10,000 I can take as ITC. Then, the goods valuing 10,000 was received 180 days ago. So, that ITC I would have taken 180 days ago. So, how much ITC I can take now? This 1,10,000. So, B is the correct answer. Are you guys following? Okay, next. How much of the ITC needs to be added to the output tax liability? Why should I add some ITC to output tax liability? Now look at this third point, what it says. Goods valuing 10 lakh and GST is 1 lakh. So which means that 11 lakh worth purchase I had made 180 days before. Now, how much I have made payments so far? 4 lakh 40,000 only I have made payments so far. Now question number one to you is this. Is payment a precondition for taking ITC? In section 16, which talks about conditions for taking ITC, is payment a precondition for taking ITC? No, it is not a precondition. There is no need to make payment for you to take ITC. There are four conditions otherwise needs to be satisfied, which does not have payment as a precondition. So, it is not a precondition. Okay. But after you take ITC, Government expect you to make payment to whom? To your supplier. So you are somebody who made an inward supply. You are a recipient at this point, a registered recipient who wants to take ITC and you are supposed to make payment to your supplier. The supplier would have paid taxes because his time of supply has happened. But I have not made payment to him, but I have already enjoyed the ITC. So there is a provision 
in section 16 to Redworth rule 37. Again, section is not relevant because it's an MCQ question. In this, they are putting a payment condition for reversing ITC. It's not for availing ITC. They said, if you make the payment within 180 days from your invoice, there is no problem, no need to reverse ITC. But what happens if you don't make payment within 180 days, you will have to reverse the ITC that you have taken together with interest. Are you guys with me? Together with interest, you will have to, yes, 18% interest also you will have to pay. But what if after some, after 180 days, say after 250 days, I actually made the payment. Can I reclaim that ITC that I have reversed? Yes, I can reavail the ITC. That's the term that is being used. Reavail the ITC in such cases. Okay, so you have to reverse. But what if I have made partial payment? Say in this particular question, in this particular question, what has happened? 10 lakh was the invoice. Did I make payment of entire 10 lakh? No, I have made payment of 4 lakh. So how much is the pending payment after 180 days? 6 lakh. How much is the GST on that 6 lakh? 60,000. So this 60,000 should I reverse? Yes, I have to reverse 60,000. So what will be the answer? Determine the amount of ITC to be added to the output tax liability. This is 60,000. Next question. Which of the following is correct in respect of document to be issued by the firm for understatement and overstatement of invoice value so for understatement of invoice value means that i have given invoice lesser i want to increase the invoice what is the document that i'll issue debit note if i want to reduce the value or if i have overstated the uh, invoice what is the document i'll issue credit note so i'll have to see how much is the understatement how much is the overstatement Outward supply, which the value of supply was understated by 75,000. So, for 75,000, what document? What document for 75,000? Debit note. For 45,000, it was overstated. So, I have to issue credit note. Okay. So, how much for debit note? Debit note for 75,000. So, first one is correct. And credit note is for 45,000. So 1 and 4 are the correct one. So which is the option A is 1 and 3, not correct. Option B is 2 and 3. Option C is 1 and 4. 1 and 4 is what we had here. So C is the correct answer. Then fifth question, which of the following statement is correct in respect of supply of goods received from by a firm which are taxable under reverse charge? Firm received certain supply of goods from registered person on which tax was payable under reverse charge basis. You had paid the taxes under reverse charge basis. What document will have to be issued? for that okay let's look at the um, sentences that we have the firm shall issue a payment voucher at the time of making payment to the supplier the firm shall issue invoice for supply of goods now this will depend upon whether the the actual supplier is a registered person or not so I have received goods from somebody, okay, and I have to pay tax under reverse charge basis, okay. So I now I need to have some document to prove this. I am making payment to the supplier, so I ha I have to actually have some document to prove that particular payment. So what document will I have to prove the payment that I have made to the supplier is the question. Okay, so the option number one, the firm shall issue a payment voucher at the time of making payment to the supplier, which is correct. The firm shall issue invoice for such, uh, for supply of goods. The firm shall issue receipt voucher at the time of making payment to the supplier. No, the firm is making payment. The firm is not required to issue any document in respect of such supply. 
Now, in this particular case, the actual supplier, the firm received certain supply from registered person, which means that the actual supplier, registered person, will issue the invoice. Okay, so only document that the recipient will have to issue in this particular case is only when they make the payment, which will be a payment box. Firm received certain supply of goods from registered person on which tax was payable under reverse charge basis. When will that recipient has to issue an invoice for receipt of goods? Only when the supplier is an unregistered person, then they'll have to issue a they will have to issue a invoice and a payment voucher to prove that they are uh, making payment as well as they are you know uh, they are having they are paying the taxes on such particular invoices. Okay, so in this particular case. They have to they have to issue only one document, which would be which would be a which is a payment voucher that they have to issue because that other person is uh, other other person is already a registered person. Question number six. Sahil, a resident of Delhi, is having a residential property in Vasant Vihar, Delhi, which has been given on rent to a family for 50 lakh per annum. Determine whether Sahil is liable to pay GST on such rent. The option, I'll read the options. You tell me which one is the correct answer. Yes, as services by way of renting is taxable under GST. No, service by way of renting of residential property is exempt. No services by way of renting of residential property does not constitute supply. D. Sahil being an individual is not liable to pay GST, which is the correct answer here. D. Because it's a residential property. There's an exemption which says that giving residential property for residential purpose, renting of residential property for residential purpose is exempt from GST. D is the correct answer. Seventh question, various taxes have been subsumed in GST to make one nation, one tax, one market for consumers. Out of the following, determine which taxes have been subsumed in GST. You'll have to tell me which are the taxes that needs to be, uh, which got, uh, you know, uh, merged under GST. So, don't have to explain all of this. You'll have to tell me which are the taxes that got merged under GST. So, first one is basic customs duty. Did customs duty get merged under GST? Did customs duty get merged under GST? No, customs duty is still there. It did not get merged under GST. Second, taxes on lotteries. Did it get customs duty is not merged? It's still there. Still on import and export, we have customs duty, right? Taxes on lottery, did it get merged? Yes. Environment tax. Did we discuss about environment taxes somewhere? Did you learn about environment taxes somewhere got merged under GST? No, there was nothing like environment taxes that got merged under GST. What taxes was actually merged under GST? Something starts with E, which could be confusing for you. What was that? Entertainment taxes, not environment taxes. There's something called entertainment taxes, but that also. Entertainment taxes that is collected by whom was uh, uh, who uh, collected by whom is still there. There is some entertainment taxes that is still there. Entertainment taxes by state government is merged under GST. Entertainment taxes by local authority is still being collected. Correct. So, which is the correct answer? A is the correct answer. Tax on lotteries are now merged under GST. Question number 8. Goods as per section 252 of CGST Act 2017 includes goods includes actionable claims, growing crops attached to the land, agreed to be severed before the supply, money, securities. Money and security are they included in uh, goods? No, they are not included in goods. So what is included in goods? Only actionable claims are in goods are every see the definition goes like this 252 says goods are every kind of movable property which includes actionable claims, growing crops or 
uh, you know growing crops attached to the land which are agreed to be severed before the supply but it excludes money and security so this is the definition which which is there in the uh, act so in that what is included only actionable claim and growing crops so c is the correct answer only one and two are included money and securities are excluded Okay, next question number nine. Mr. Mr. Z of uh, Himachal Pradesh starts a new business and makes following supplies in the first month. Intrastate supply of taxable goods amounting to 17 lakhs. Supply of exempted goods amounting to 1 lakh. Interstate supply of taxable goods amounting to 1 lakh. Whether he is required to obtain registration is the question. What's his aggregate turnover? Himachal Pradesh comes under which category? which limit 40 lakhs limited comes under general category okay it is 40 lakhs limit yeah so next question is what's their aggregate turnover their aggregate turnover is 17 plus 1 plus 180 but do they do they have section 22 applicable or do they have section 24 applicable Sorry, it is 19 lakhs. Okay, it's irrelevant, but still I have to be correct on the numbers. Section 24 is applicable. Why? What is section 24? Section 22 is actually threshold based registration. Section 24 is compulsory registration. Why are you saying it's compulsory registration? Because they are making interstate supply of taxable goods. Only handicraft goods will get a, will get threshold limit there. All other goods, whenever you make an interstate supply, you cannot really check the threshold limit. You have to mandately take registration. Section 24 is applicable. Mandatory registration. So, which is the correct answer? Mr. Z is liable to obtain registration as the threshold limit of 10 lakh is crossed. No, that's not correct. Mr. Z is uh, not liable to obtain registration as he makes exempted supplies. Not correct. Mr. Z is liable to obtain registration as he makes interstate supply of goods. This is correct. He is the correct one. Now let's look at the next question. Wedding Bells, a wedding photographer, has commenced providing free wedding shoot services in Jaipur. From beginning of the current financial year, that is 2020-21. So they started doing the business from 2021. What is that they are doing? They are a wedding photographer. Like there is this that Hidey movie, which is you know wedding photography. So their wedding bells is the you know wedding photography group. So they started their uh, businesses from first of April two thousand and twenty. It has provided the following details of turnover for various quarters till December. Yeah, so I'll do a timeline for you for easy understanding of this. 1st April 2020 started business supply of services so anybody if they start business okay if they if, if somebody starts their business is they, are they required to take immediate registration so they're in Jaipur no, they can. They need to take registration only when their turnover exceeds. If they are in service, what's the turnover limit that will be applicable in Rajasthan? Twenty lakhs. So when did their turnover crosses twenty lakhs? June. So June 30, 2020. Till then, their turnover was twenty lakhs. Are they registered or unregistered? During this period, they are unregistered during this period. Then, from June, which means 1st to July, till September, their turnover is 30 lakhs. 
they are registered okay then from october to december the turnover is 40 lakhs they are registered again what is the other question asked you may assume applicable tax rate to be 18 percent wedding bells wishes to pay tax at a lower rate and opt for composition scheme you are required to advise whether it can do so calculate the amount of tax payable for each quarter my question here is that are they eligible for composition levy scheme are they eligible for 10 1 and 10 2 a normal composition levy scheme 10 1 are they eligible no 10 1 is eligible for services only one type of services are eligible for composition levy scheme under section 10 1 which is that service only restaurants are eligible for composition levy scheme but there is a new scheme that has come from 2019 onwards what is that scheme section number now it is included in the section what is the section number can somebody put it on section 10 to capital a in 10 to capital a if they wanted to opt what is the additional condition so any service provider can opt for 10 to a but what is the additional condition that they have to satisfy their last year turnover has to be less than 50 lakhs this particular company that is wedding bells can they offer 10 to a yes because their last year previous financial year turnover is zero because they started their business only in this particular financial year okay, so they can opt for that so what they did they they did not take registration till their turnover is 20 lakhs after that they have registered also they have opted for 10 to a so the first question is can they offer 10 to a composition levy scheme yes what is the benefit that they'll get when they offer composition scheme 10 to a so gst will be 3% cgst and 3% sgst and that will be computed on what on the turnover of 30 lakhs so how much will be cgst how much will be sgst you tell me so first 20 lakhs no gst because they are unregistered you need to even take a registration for the next 30 lakhs, 90,000 CGST, 90,000 SGST. Now, in the current financial year, up to how much turnover I can op I can continue to be under 10 to a? Up to 50 lakhs of turnover. So, will, that, will I compute that 50 lakhs of turnover from my registration or from starting of the financial year, from 1st April or from registration? From How do I compute that? From 1st April, I have to compute start of a financial year right so my when did i when did i finish my 50 lakhs turnover 20 plus 30 i i reached at 50 lakhs turnover by september which means that only for the 30 lakhs of turnover additional i can take this concessional rate of three percent and three percent so from october onwards what will be the rate that will be applicable for my services it will be normal rate that is 18 percentage so cgst at nine percent SGST at 9%. How much will be that? On 40 lakhs. 3 lakh 60. 3 lakh 60. So, what will be my total liability? It will be 4 lakh 50. 4 lakh 50. understanding and how you present this is also important an ideal presentation will not be like this an ideal presentation would be a chart you can add here for each of this particular turnover what will be cgst what will be sgst and you can give a remark or you can give a working note that will be the correct presentation that you can have you can always look at the uh, notes that i have given you can uh, find how the answer as answer is being given there Is this clear to all of you? Can we go to the next question? Okay. Question number 11. Mr. Priyam, Director of Sun Moon Company Private Limited, provided services to company for remuneration of 1,25,000. Briefly answer whether GST is applicable in below mentioned independent cases. If yes, who is liable to pay GST? Mr. Priyam is a director. 
and he gets a remuneration of 120000 okay you have to tell in each of the cases who is liable to pay so this is basically 9 subsection 3 notification 13 by 2017 rcm cases that we are trying to discuss okay first case mr priyam is an independent director and is not an employee an independent director providing services to the company director providing services to a body corporate being the company what is the uh, charge that is applicable rcm is applicable so who will have to pay sun moon company private limited will have to pay taxes to the government then this is actually based on a circular clarification that came in so that circular clarification says that see there are multiple type of directors that you can have like you can have managing director executive director independent director full time director how do i differentiate which payment to the director should come under rcm which payment to the director will not be a supply he said the easiest method of identification is that if it is salary it will not be even a supply if they are employees and if there is if it is salary if they are employees it is not necessary that every payment will be salary say for example i am a, a managing director of a company i am getting salary apart from that i am getting some other payment for my professional capacity i am giving some other services not gift i am talking about some other services itself how do i differentiate between whether my service was actually and uh, uh, as per the employment contract whether my service is uh, beyond employment contract that will depending upon i can further check this based on how the company has deducted tds if if a director received salary what section under income tax they would have deducted tds under 192 so if there is a payment to a director and uh, and tds is deducted under 192 it means that it's a salary it's an employment contract if they have deducted TDS under section 194J, for example, which is a professional payment, then will that amount be a salary? No, that will not be a salary. So if the deduction is under 194J, I can say that it will it will be outside salary and it will be taxable and it will be taxable under reverse charge mechanism if it was provided by a director to its, his own company. Okay, as a director, I can provide services to anybody. So that will not come under RCM. To his own company so let's read the second question here mr priyam is an executive director that is an employee of sun moon company limited out of the total remuneration amounting to 1 lakh 60000 has been declared as salary in the books of sun and moon company private limited subject to tds under 192 is that 60000 uh, subject to gst no because it is not a supply which schedule says that Schedule 3. Schedule 3 para 1 says that it's not even a supply. Then, what about 65,000? However, rupees 65,000 has been declared separately other than salaries in Sun and Moon Company Private Limited's accounts and subject to TDS under Section 194J. If it is deducted under 194J, will it be considered to be a salary? No, it's not salary, it's professional payment. Will it be subject to GST? Yes. And what charge will be applicable rcm will be applicable who is liable to pay uh, taxes to the government then it will be sun moon company limited for 65000 okay now let's look at question number 12 Ms. Kashi is a registered intrastate supplier of goods in Haryana. During the month of August and September, she was out of station for religious pilgrimage with her family for 55 days. Thus, no business transaction was made during August. Ms. Kashi is of the opinion that there is no transaction, there is no need to file monthly return of 3B for the month of August. However, her tax consultant, suppose you are the tax consultant, what will be your advice? Can she skip filing 3B? No, she will have to still file a 3B. So they said nil uh, 3B has to be filed. Whether the advice given by the tax consultant is correct, explain. Is the advice correct? 
GSTR yes, advice is correct. GSTR 3B is mandatory in all cases. Even if there is no business activity, nil return needs to be filed. Okay, so your advice is correct. B, will your answer in A change? If Ms. Kashi has placed an order from some purchases during August over her mobile phone, which has been received in her premise and she intends to take ITC on the same. Can she still go ahead and then file nil return? Yeah, 3B needs to be filed. The question here, that's already tested in first question, right? In uh, uh, A, it is tested. Now, when we are talking about B, what is that they're testing? Can you go ahead and then file nil? Nil return means in all the tables in 3B, in all the tables in 3B, it has to be either nil or no information. Okay, here you have to fill your ITC column your I table for eligible ITC you have to fill. So it is not nil return. You have to file a normal return. Okay. Then C. Assuming in A above, Ms. Kashi does not have internet facility in her mobile and there is no facilitation center notified by the commissioner. Whether no return is required to be filed in the absence of means to file return. Explain. Can she change her claim that I don't have uh, you know any internet facility available with me and I cannot do any filing that it is possible <laughs> all that uh, you know claim that she is making what is the latest option that is available you can file your nil return using SMS facility correct from registered mobile number you can actually use SMS facility to file nil return so that claim is also not valid so here you can give an SMS based nil return it was a change that came at that time. So that's why they are asking that question. Here. So the next question. Bali Limited, a registered taxpayer, provides security services to a registered persons from Mumbai, from Mumbai office and Delhi office. So Bali Limited is providing security service. The aggregate turnover of Mumbai office and Delhi office in the preceding financial year is 300 crores and 250 crores respectively. For the month of November in the current financial year, Bali Limited prepares duplicate invoices and does not issue e-invoices as it is of the view that its aggregate turnover does not cross threshold limit to make it liable for issuing e-invoices. Briefly explain whether the view taken by Bali Limited is correct in the law and also explain the advantage of e invoicing. So, this particular in this particular case, uh, they are testing you with e invoicing, and e invoicing was introduced at that particular time, May 21. So, what is the limit that we have for e invoicing? Because the limit was changed after this. So, when you are looking at this question number 13 in your RTP, there is an amendment to this. It is amended further. Yesterday, in my discussion, I had already discussed you about e invoicing. Who is not liable for e invoicing? You remember? Now, it is not 500 crores now, it is 50 crores now. That is the change. First 500 crores, then they change to 100 crores, then they change to 50 crores. So that is a change. It is amended further. It is now 50 crores. Limit is 50 crores from any in any financial year from 17 18. If your turnover exceeded 50 crores, you will have to comply with invoicing provision okay so what's the aggregate turnover of Bali limited here aggregate turnover is a turnover in a in a in a state or turnover on all India basis 
all india basis so what's the aggregate turnover for her in the last financial year not her it's bali limited what's the turnover it is 550 crores it's above 50 crores so definitely they'll have to comply with the invoicing they have also asked uh, questions like what are the benefits of the invoicing of course you uh, you know tax evasion will be less easy reconciliation it will be auto generated in your uh, gstr1 and eway bill so all of these are the benefits that you have with the invoicing provision but there is an amendment that you have to be aware of so that concludes our discussion on uh, may 2021 article